Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, we look forward to talking to, to you today. My name is James Fox. I lead our cloud consulting business at Protivity here in the UK. Uh, we, this morning, we're joined by Dr. Sebastian Wesenewski. Uh, we have David Knott and we also have Steve Hooper. Uh, Dr. Sebastian is from Standard Chartered. David is from Google and Steve Hooper is from Barclays. Collectively, uh, we have been working together with AFNI and a cloud working group representing member firms to develop a paper, setting out approaches on how, on how firms are building resilience as they adopt cloud services. Uh, this is particularly important uh, in light of the continued growth in adoption of cloud services, uh, particularly being spurred on by the recent pandemic where cloud has really been uh, put to test in terms of enabling scalability and also remote working for many firms. Many of you be also aware of the increasing focus on cloud from policymakers, regulators as part of a broader regulatory narrative covering outsourcing, third party risk management, concentration risk and operational resilience. Uh, for example, DORA uh, is, is very much topical right now from an operational resilience perspective with many considerations and implications for consumption of, of cloud services. So our session this morning really is to, to launch our, uh, a new paper, a position paper uh, from AFNI discussing uh, how, how firms really are looking to build resilience uh, in the cloud. Uh, this paper explores the continued adoption and strategic importance of cloud to firms. Uh, the approaches that are proactively being taken to address resilience, as well as focusing on, on two of the main solutions that are typically emerging in discussions between regulators and policymakers for cloud resilience. These are really centering around portability of data applications workloads. So this is whereby um, uh, firms are being asked to look at moving data, moving applications uh, between cloud providers uh, in order to achieve uh, an increased level of resilience. And then secondly is really around uh, use of multi-cloud strategies. So use of more than one cloud service provider. This in essence is seeking to provide a, an enhanced level of, of third party redundancy. Uh, and we'll discuss both of these during our session today as to how we're seeing firms adopt these approaches and some of the challenges that they need to overcome in response to these. The paper is hot off the press and will be launched post this session. Uh, we hope it encourages discussion in support of further uh, considered cloud adoption in the industry. Uh, through our, our working group, it's, it's been very clear that cloud is very much being seen as a strategic uh, enabler, uh, as a differentiator for firms to be able to, to bring new services new innovative services to market uh, quicker than they have been able to, to do before. Uh, and we look forward to, to launching the paper and having some good conversations and discussions in the weeks to come uh, regarding this. For the remainder of our, our session this morning, as I mentioned, we're joined by three uh, panelists from, from industry. Uh, first up, uh, we were going to hear from Dr. Sebastian Wedenewski from Standard Charter. Uh, Sebastian is going to talk to us about the, the strategic importance of cloud uh, for, for firms and particularly we're going to hear a little bit about what Standard Chartered are doing uh, in relation to, to cloud adoption. Over to yourself Sebastian. Thanks, thanks very much James. Yes, uh, very well introduced. Thank you and uh, great to see and to participate on this uh, resilience paper and driving it forward. So as, as James introduced, yes, so I'm, I'm the global head uh, for cloud and DevOps at Standard Charter Bank. So Standard Charter Bank um, is, uh, you know, in 59 markets, especially in Asia, Middle East and Africa. And as you can imagine, across all of these different markets, there is uh, a diverse needs of, on compute. 
and uh, going also in this new business models journey with uh, you know open banking digital banking virtual banking a lot of lot of concepts in different markets in africa hong kong now also in singapore and all of that going there it's it's a huge demand to be more um, location agnostic, uh, be also more contextual uh, in the edge with services, financial services, more embedded in, into a context, in a business context, um, how we should provide. And all these advantages are coming with, with the cloud. And uh, we, on this journey where we are and what I'm explaining a bit like, yes, with all the demands, uh, we, we have a multi-cloud strategy. So we, we have um, AWS and Azure um, as our strategic cloud uh, service providers uh, selected and brought a lot of uh, workload already into production. Um, in, in this sense, to explain a bit where we are and how we evolved over the time, it's already a multi-year journey for, for reaching to this multi-cloud strategy and also this experience and efficiency, how we are going into the cloud. Because I, I would frame it in like three phases. Um, we started first time in 2013. Yes, so there was a first engagement with AWS. Uh, we ex uh, explored a couple of proof of concepts, what kind of risk analysis, primary compute. Yes, so as you can imagine, this regulation and all of that, data is usually what is driving uh, more uh, approvals and regulations. If you go just on computes, that was the easier stage to start in the 2013. And we had done, uh, especially with the capabilities of, uh, of cloud to be elastic and to grow workload and compute workload very efficiently. So in this kind of risk analysis space, this is where we started. And I, I think this is quite common, how to see the values of a, of a cloud um, in, in, in financial services. So that is what I would call really then with 2013 and 2015, we went really with actual workload into production is what I call the phase one, because it was still quite homogeneous workload, was more you know specific individual uh, compute intensive applications what we brought into the uh, production like grid and all of this kind of thing so um, but gave us a lot of lessons learned and also then the requirements how we should do resiliency and operations and all of that so that is like the phase one phase two got in in a kind of program yeah, so then how we are targeting to migrate, like, for example, the first 15 application, one five. So that was really like, okay, now let's go to a more diverse uh, workload, but still focused and still in uh, specific domains, primarily because then it charters corporate banking, uh, retail banking, uh, and, you know, private banking, wealth management, all this kind of area. We started there also specifically in, in the corporate banking area. And we, we really brought it up to in this phase, uh, phase two to, to, to 15 application. But as you can imagine, also a lot of things has happened by project by project and step by step. It was a program, so it was formally also organized, but it was not what we call what is now the phase three, uh, like a cloud factory. Yes, so, and in a cloud factory, really, how we can scale, how we go enterprise-wide, how we bring now, really, when you see the target, what we have shaped then even in 2020, we, we make it formally as a five years strategy, cloud first strategy, um, um, with the board, with the whole management team, to, to bring 50% of our core banking systems of our you know trade trading systems into the public cloud yes so and then of course that all new applications are built natively for cloud and in 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 this situation we we further evolved now in this phase three where we are now and uh, we have more than 60 applications in in the public cloud with all the cloud factories in functions in retail in um, corporate banking how we are driving this multi-cloud strategy now with multi-region 
Uh, there is now the beauty of, of the cloud that we are not just tied to one location with one data um, center uh, centrally. So it's really like now getting really what I said uh, in the beginning, the, the advantages for business to be more location agnostic, to go really this open banking, really this um, you know contextual banking journey. And this is where we are now. So now we are um, having a huge focus on um, how we solve all resilience um, expectations. There are like this guidelines from PRA, from, from UK, there are the guidelines from MAS, uh, how we, we should meet the different resilience requirements and how we also um, should now get more and more mature on this cloud factory approach as we are getting more workload in, into the cloud. Yes, yeah, so and with the aspiration and also with the targets of this next uh, four years, to get to 75% of our workload into the cloud. This is where we are right now. And uh, also this paper um, where we really started with James and all there is like capturing the lessons learned, capturing also like what really matters now in this um, a journey in the conversations on compliance, on regulations, on policies, on uh, the infrastructures, uh, how to go further is how we meet the guidelines, how we make them more efficient, how we are getting uh, material uh, applications like core banking, payment systems, and all of that, where we have brought now the core banking system so far, just in this year, now in production for five markets. Um, and as you see, we have uh, further markets to go on our journey, uh, but this is now really uh, where we are. And uh, I can say every workload what we have in the cloud is a success, is a business value. So sometimes we are still not fast enough with our turnaround time, with our you know efficiency, how we are getting this sale into production. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we are working close with the cloud service providers. Yes, of course. Course, not all services what we need for resilience are always available in all regions. Uh, but uh, with the regulations, like for example, Indonesia or Pakistan and so on, then we have to also consider uh, data requirements and also then the requirements of um, you know, failover scenarios, etc. So this is where we are, um, a huge success story. Um, so far, one next future going farther, as you can imagine, as I explained, our footprint, we, we have now also the lessons learned, okay, AWS Azure is really good good for the multi-cloud strategy for us, where we went with our footprint. But in our footprint, these are two US corporate. And we also recognize in the current situation how we are going farther. And you know we have the Hong Kong situation. We have a lot of things in, in, in Asia that we have also to consider multi-cloud um, in, in concentration risk beyond of US-based companies. So we have to also think in, in Asia footprint uh, how we drive this further. But this is a journey where we are and where we are going farther now for the next year. So James, a bit like this is a wrap up and um, yeah, I'm open for, for questions later. Thanks. Thank you, Sebastian. And uh, some great insights there, uh, particularly, I think the use of, of cloud for some of your trading systems, um, as well as uh, looking to design all of your applications as, as being cloud native. I think uh, it'd be fair to say, you know, in our cloud working group, uh, yourself and, and reps from, from Standard Charter were, were, were kind of in that bucket of being kind of more advanced in your consumption of cloud services. Uh, I think for, for everyone attending here, we, we, there's definitely a, uh, a spectrum uh, amongst the firms of, of firms who are very much advanced in using cloud and, and firms who are at the start of their journey as well. And, and this paper really looks at supporting firms at both ends of that journey and in between um, as well. So thank you, Sebastian, for, for your input today. And, and thank you for, for your input into the, into the paper. Uh, as Sebastian mentioned, before we do move on to our next speaker, uh, I just wanted to, to call out that in, 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 please raise questions. Uh, we will be uh, looking to open to the floor uh, at the end of this session. We'll have uh, five to 10 minutes to, to, to discuss questions. So please type any of your questions. We'll get them to come through and we will put them to uh, the panelists uh, at the end to cover any particular areas in, in more, more detail uh, regarding the topics we're, we're discussing this morning. 
Moving on next, so next up is Stephen Hooper. He's the head of the Cloud Center of Excellence at Barclays, uh, and he will be sharing his thoughts on some of the uh, adoption of, of cloud, um, as well as um, some of the broader uh, specific regulatory uh, challenges uh, and how some of them may, may be overcome and some of the, the support that, that, that's required uh, as we move forward. Yeah. Thanks, James. Um... Thanks for the introduction, guys. Uh, as James says, uh, I'm the head of the COE for Barclays. Uh, when James and the team asked us to contribute to the paper, I had uh, quite a lot of passionate thoughts about some of this area, which is why I'm sure he's asked me to talk today. Um, and I'll be kind of really pleased to give you some of my insights from the journey that Barclays has had for quite a few years now. Just as a bit of background, obviously, Barclays name is well known in the marketplace, but we are a leading global universal bank. And as such, many of our services uh, uh, are of systematic importance to the to the marketplace. Slightly differently to Sebastian, um, I suppose our journey, like his, is is multi year, and we have a multi cloud strategy. Um, we probably took a much earlier stance on enterprise wide adoption of cloud, um, and therefore we are uh, let's say a few more years into that journey around how we better enable federated access to services and how we think about the implications of uh, a global footprint and, and, and regulation. But effectively, we do both have a, a private and public cloud technology stacks that we operate in Barclays. In terms of our use of cloud technology at this point, I suppose in simple language, we have enabled general adoption of higher order differentiating services. So we're talking about the, the SaaS serverless offerings, big data, those kind of services, as well as compute and those other things. Uh, some amazing, really inventive stuff going on from, from cloud in our, in, in our space. So some hundred services generally available to application teams across, uh, across the Barclays estate. And, uh, and like Sebastian, we are deploying material workloads across both our public and private off offerings with material workloads in a number of regulatory jurisdictions. Uh, in terms of cloud adoption, just to kind of uh, build on that point and, and add to it, I suppose recently to set some context of the importance of cloud to Barclays, it's really allowed us to rapidly respond to unexpected changes like, uh, uh, like COVID and the challenges that that placed. So a number of the cloud technologies and services that we offer were pivotal to our ability to respond to issues like uh, call center availability and allowing our staff to access call center capability safely. And uh, I suppose the increased uh, impact we saw on our digital channels as, uh, you know, uh, lockdowns in different countries and different areas resulted in uh, customers who would normally go into branches and have face-to-face -face operations moving more to our digital or call center channels. Uh, I think it's fair for me to say that, uh, I, you know, we would have struggled greatly without our ability to exploit cloud agility and capacity to uh, make those services available rapidly. Um, we've also used cloud to, uh, I suppose, better enable high performance and resilience through the use of, uh, of automation as well. So uh, that ability to access uh, ubiquitous capacity and through automation ensure more predictable results as we rebuild, redeploy and scale up our infrastructure is really allowing us to, uh, to improve on resilience. Uh, even if you don't factor in, as Sebastian says, our ability to exploit far more hosting locations and that global footprint. So, so moving on, talking a little bit about, uh, I suppose, uh, my experiences uh, from a COE perspective, just to explain as the head of the COE and because we have a number of SMEs in this field, we tend to be heavily involved in the adoption of cloud from both sides of the spectrum, both from application teams who are trying to consume it, because as I said, we do have general availability of, of, of federated access for application teams uh, and, and also from from a governance perspective i'm a great supporter and uh, a member of let's say the governance community is in general right and the importance of being able to make sure that we enable uh, people to use our platforms our cloud whether it be public or private in in, in a safe and secure way so I suppose the big challenges that we have seen that stick in my mind from this time that we have spent doing it, uh, go, for, uh, go through a number of areas, but I'll try and go through it chronologically, right? So the, the first challenge that we really had to focus on that I think is a challenge for any organization that wants to adopt cloud generally and, and implement general cloud, uh, cloud adoption is 
how we change the way that we do governance when services are available to application teams and built by application teams and deployed through their change processes. So effectively, I'm talking about there, how do we create processes for controlling cloud placement in terms of the workloads and operational decisions around how they work uh, on which internal and external governance stakeholders can depend. So if we're going to make it available, we're gonna have that time to market benefit that we want to get from Barclays, we need to look at how we change the way that we do governance and interact with governance communities to allow us to exploit that agility and time to market. And then from that, I suppose you get to the big point, which is a really interesting challenge, which is how do you streamline the various notification and approval processes that have to be performed on an individual app by app basis. So you get them down to crystallize into just those things that are necessary for that application use case that's unique. And how do you make sure that that process is streamlined as far as possible? So things like material outsource processes being done with, by application teams through that, through that mechanism can be done in a, in a safe and timely fashion, I suppose is a good way of describing it. On from there, you move on to that thing related to governance then, which is how to align the cloud and the governance propositions that you have both internally and externally as a financial organization. So from there, the most important thing for me as a starting point is how do you grow your stakeholder understanding of the cloud proposition? How do you let their understanding of cloud technologies and the cloud paradigm mature alongside your build teams? Because often, you know, your build teams get excited and move off really quickly and there's that risk that they wait till the end until they engage the cloud um, governance communities or the governance communities surrounding that and that causes you problems. So it's how do you build their skills, mature their understanding so that you can collaboratively work on uh, when cloud controls or when controls required for cloud and how best to apply them in an effective way. And from there, it's about, uh, I suppose, changing and rethinking the existing control objectives that you have to better accommodate cloud. Uh, it, I suppose, certainly from my side, not just, you know, talking about Barclays, but in general, uh, historically, a lot of standards tends to be solution based rather than outcome based. And that can cause problems with cloud when you're looking at ways of doing things which are necessitated to be uh, to be different because you're using uh, immutable infrastructure or short-lived paradigms that that don't that haven't existed before. So some of the solutions that that become your standards are things that don't really work in a in a cloud model. And then I suppose taking that on and thinking on from that, it's about how do you automate the enforcement of those standards and controls. Can you codify them? Can you bring them into logic that controls deployment uh, so that you're able to, uh, I suppose, better support that uh, dynamic working behavior, the ability to deploy rapidly through pipelines and those other capabilities and bring those standards in with the massive benefit being that uh, you can implement enforcement and control in a real time and an ongoing basis. And as part of that, which has been a challenge that we've uh, worked heavily on is how do you shift that information to the left? So for example, how do you codify some of your security and risk standards? How do you codify thoughts about architectural best practice and then put them into tools? Linting tools are a great example of where you can do that. So you place those kind of characteristics of what good and bad looks like into a linting tool and you make that linting tool available for developers so that they can actually uh, use that in their deployment pipelines in their in, in the code UIs that they use to identify them to them immediately when they're building things which may not be compliant with your policy right and then I suppose the the most interesting challenge which as James says is becoming more and more prevalent in terms of people's thinking at this moment is how do you measure and manage the consolidation challenges when the platform that you're using is now potentially ubiquitous across both you as a business and the suppliers that you use as well so how do you get a better idea of what your your what your placement risk is with a particular cloud service provider for example and understand how that impacts your different business processes on from there, I suppose, and governance related uh, challenges and uh, and, uh, and guidance or I suppose insight, you start to think about the more technical things. I am at heart an architect, I'm a cloud solutions architect. I come from that background. My, my whole background is infrastructure architecture and has been for, you know, predominantly as long as I've been in IT. 
uh, and, and I suppose it, they are areas that are important to me in terms of our ability to, again, federate access. If we're going to federate responsibility onto application teams to build the right things, uh, then you need to be able to make sure that they are informed and able to make the right choices. So questions to challenge yourself with uh, around, for example, how to enable your architects to reason about how they distribute their components to mitigate resilience threats. Do they have the information they, un they need to understand blast radius and stuff like that? And how to effectively allow them to balance resilience cost and risk. And I suppose I should say complexity as well, because the danger always is that in the search for perfect uh, resilience, you build solutions which don't make business sense or that you create things which are so complex that in solving, let's say, geographical risks, physical location risks, you create systems which are so complex to operate and maintain that you introduce risks related to change delivered failure. And, and things, you know, predominantly, in my experience, will go long wrong more often if you overcomplicate them. Because I suppose, as many of us know, most resilience problems are really the result of change being introduced by a party. It, either by you know the provider of the platform uh, or by the salute the pe people building the solution so there's always that need for a, an architect to be able to reason about uh, have they got the balance of cost risk and complexity right those things you see in the well architecture framework for example and then on from there how to assist service owners with them validating the resilience of the things that have been built so where possible, for example, uh, the ability to use fault injection so that they can demonstrate continued operation of their services. And how do you make fault injection tool sets capabilities available ubiquitously and again in a safe way if you're going to run them in production environments, for example. And again, I suppose on from there, being realistic. Uh, the cloud paradigm, certainly in a public sense, means that there are a number of systems where how resilience is achieved is not under the control of the consumer. And that means that there are no switches that can be flipped to allow you to perform some of the, you know, some of those tests. So we've got to be able to consider as a, a technology community and a governance community, what other verifiable facts that can we rely on when testing is not possible? Because certainly from my experience, there are a number of use cases that anyone consuming cloud will confront where they don't have the ability to, you know, if, if, if required, replicate the failure of a hosting location, an AZ, for example, right? So fundamentally, they need to be able to reason about how their solution will work, whether that's a desktop exercise or not. But when they're doing that, they need to be able to diligently demonstrate that they did that based on facts on which that you know they can rely. That probably then moves me on to, uh, I suppose, the couple of final points that were most important for me in terms of contribution to the paper. And I suppose I'll title them up as, how can we as a community help the consumers of cloud because there are some things which I would say are difficult, if not impossible for an individual to do on their own. So uh, for example, uh, from a governance community perspective, we could really do with creating consistent views of what good looks like across, you know, as broadly as possible. So as the paper sets out around uh, resilience themes, for example, we operate resilience themes. Uh, what we could ideally do with as a community globally is coming up with a broadly accepted view of resilience themes. And again, back to that need to do things in a cost effective and a, a, a kind of a, a managed way. We need to also be able to uh, share and uh, view and broadly accept the plausibility of those views. So, you know, resilience right from account compromise, single instance failure, right up to, you know, uh, CSP failure scenarios. Because uh, I suppose uh, from my perspective, that takes me on to uh, the kind of recognition that technology portability or technology in general cannot be the answer for all scenarios. Uh, I, you know, and this is a personal view, it's not a Barclays view, I'm not suggesting that Barclays has this position at all, but uh, as a technologist, uh, whilst I 
uh, uh, respect and I'm aware of a number of technologies out there that provide some level of portability. I think if we were to sit here and say that we can create technology solutions that can deal with every manner of a stressed exit scenario, for example, I think we would be being unrealistic with ourselves as a community. Um, and, and for me, that means that we've got to consider what we mean by portability and not just assume that the answer is a technology one. And, and I suppose that then goes on to, I suppose, having a, a commonly accepted or acknowledged view of, 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 again, of consolidation risk management, because if we see technology portability in a multi-cloud vendor way, we need to consider the risks that are and the complexity that's being associated with that requirement. And, and if we don't do that, we then need to be careful that we are setting good expectations or have a view of what good looks like when it comes to consolidation risk management. And then on from that final point, from a governance perspective as well, uh, having that acceptance that I talked about of the need for alternative ways of validating resilience. Many of the you know, requirements that are, are presented to me or have been presented to us from a resilience perspective historically talk about the need to test. Uh, you know, it, you have to test to prove this works or doesn't work. And uh, I, I think there is a limit to uh, technology testing and therefore we need to rethink what the word test means in this construct. So is it I make decisions based on facts and I can test those facts to verify that they are real, for example. And then going from a cloud provider community or from a technology community perspective, uh, the two kind of biggest things that I was, uh, was passionate about, uh, and certainly one of them comes through here, hopefully quite well as a theme, uh, is the first one is where possible, uh, we need to make sure as a CSP community that we're enabling fault injection tests, which are as realistic as possible. Um, we certainly heavily involve uh, invest in, uh, in uh, resilience testing, uh, and we do use fault injection in Barclays, uh, and we are therefore quite aware of the, what the limits of what you can and can't do, uh, and, uh, and sometimes uh, tests uh, you, you need to ask yourself the question, am I actually testing the failure scenario or am I testing graceful things on the control plane? If I tell it to nicely fail over, will it do it, for example? Um, and then where those fault tests can't be used, as we talked about before, I suppose uh, for me, portability is a lot about better availability from the CSPs of service resilience facts so that when a customer is looking at uh, which platform to host on originally, or if they need to construct a plan, which means that they can move if required between vendors, it's making sure that the facts around resilience are readily available to them. So, uh, so certainly um, there, there, there have been scenarios where uh, there, there's, there's always processes that can be followed, but audit related processes to gather information are time consuming and case by case. And what we need to recognize as a community uh, in terms of CSPs is the shared responsibility model it was a great starting point and still is a great starting point. But in order for us to own that part of shared responsibility, the facts need to be available to us. And that kind of moves me on to that thing of those facts could ideally do with being harmonized. And in terms of the way that we articulate blast radius and likelihood of failure of an instance of a service. I, I'm sure you all know there is not one cloud. All the vendors have multiple instances of cloud. And it's important for us as highly regulated consumers that we're able to reason about what the scope of an instance of a service looks like so that when we're not willing to accept the, the risk of failure of an instance of that service, we can easily and effectively reason about how to mitigate that by distributing our infrastructure across it. And then on from that governance perspective, be able to give our governance colleagues and stakeholders comfort that they can rely on what we've done because the, the, the decisions we've made are based on facts that the vendor has provided. And then that leads me on to that final bit then that says, if we are going to have facts that we rely on, and if you take forward the idea of what does testing mean, 
we should think about those facts in terms of how can we have an evidence back process which enables those facts to be tested when required. So when can, what is the process and how can we streamline uh, the process for me as a consumer of a cloud service to be able to go back to, the, to, to a vendor and say to them, you've given us this information about the blast radius of service uh, provide me with some evidence, you know, let's talk about evidence that you can show us, which demonstrates how we can rely on that fact, either because architecturally I can see how it's designed, or I can have comfort or, or assurance around the process that has been used to check those facts before they were provided to me. And I suppose those are the key main items that I think uh, we're, 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 we're messages that we wanted to make sure were in that paper, James. And you know, obviously I've, I've seen the, 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 the draft that's, that was put forward before. I've seen the final copy that most people are going to see after this. So I'm really pleased that a lot of that theme resonates through that. That's probably it for me, mate, uh, if that's okay yeah. with you. Thanks, Steve. And I think uh, lots of uh, great points in there. I think particularly one that resonated with most of the, the, the members as part of the, the working group was really around the need for that clarity of what what does good look like from a resilience perspective. So so many many frameworks exist um, that, that are out there that many firms are, are trying to use to, to piece together what they're doing from a resilience perspective. Not really knowing is that everything they need to be doing? Is there more that should be done? Is there less? Um, and so uh, in the paper, as one of the, the recommendations we do set out, is around the need for for greater clarity in relation to, to, to standards for, for resilience in the cloud. Noting we do have, uh, there's about three questions that have popped up. Uh, what we'll do is we will we will finish with uh, David from, from Google, and then we will come to the questions in our, our final Q&A session. So we will get to those questions. Next up, as I mentioned, is David Knott from Google. He is a digital transformation officer, uh, and, and David is going to talk to us a little around how Google as a cloud service provider uh, on the other side of the fence from Sebastian and Steve uh, are addressing resilience in the cloud and, and helping customers think about um, and address uh, resilience. Over to you, David. Great, Th thanks James and, and thanks, thanks Steve and Sebastian. I think lots of, always good, always good to hear uh, Hear from hear from customers, and we, we take it take it on board. So um, yeah, so as James says, my my role as transformation officer, my day job is to help our financial services customers transform in multiple dimensions. And one of the key dimensions they're trying to transform in is risk, reliability, and resilience. Um, I would say this coming from a cloud provider, but I, I think one of the things that I, I would assert is that I think it's possible to achieve the goals of reliability and resilience on a cloud platform, uh, on cloud platforms to a high degree to what they can be achieved on premise, but I also think the onus is on us to demonstrate why that's the case. Um, I'm just gonna share a few thoughts and, and probably the first thing I wanted to do was to distinguish between two topics I think tend to get addressed in, in, often in the same sentence and those are of reliability and resilience. And I think it's worth separating out the two. Um, so for me, reliability means planning for the things that go wrong all the time. So routine technical failure, whereas resilience is planning for the thing we hope is never going to happen, but we hope we plan for it anyway. So one's routine failure, one's catastrophic failure. Um, on the reliability side, um, just to touch on that really, really briefly, I'd say we at Google think about reliability in many dimensions, but I'll, I'll, call, I'll call out three particularly. The first already been mentioned. So why should you be capable of being more reliable on, on cloud? Um, the first obvious thing is these are hyperscale platforms that operate at, at global scale. Um, I think there are two ways of thinking about that though. The first way of thinking about it is just, there is more stuff. So when something fails, there are more instances of that thing to fail over to. So server fails, you've got more servers to fail over to. However, I think that's a relatively um, simple way to think about it. And the more sophisticated way is the thing is the way that both Sebastian and Steve alluded to, which is, the virtue of that scale isn't just that you have more stuff, it's that you actually have more failure domains to fail into. So basically you can use the features of a, the inherent physical features of a cloud platform and the logical features of a cloud platform to create boundaries and failure domains, which means you can fail from one to the other. So a server instance can fail into another server instance, a physical rack can fail into another physical rack, a cluster can fail into a cluster, a zone can fail into a zone, a region can fail into a region. So part of our goal is to, manage that scale in such a way that you've always got somewhere to go within the cloud platform. I think that's the first thing. 
Second key thing for me is something actually Steve called out, um, which is about complexity. So I think it's true that we provide a platform and the stuff that our customers deploy on that platform will be very complex and very variable, very, you know, very various. Every customer will look, will look different. But I think one of the virtues of hyperscale pl cloud platforms is at the platform layer, there's a much higher level of homogeneity and simplicity than is typically achieved on on-premise environments. And I'm somebody who comes from that world and have managed many on-premise environments and I've never achieved the level of homogeneity and harmony that is typically achieved on a cloud platform. And that basically just reduces the level of risk and um, likelihood of failure at that level, because you can keep, you know, reduce vulnerabilities, keep things up to date. And then the last point, and this is a particular thing key to Google. I mean, Google has built reliability into the way we do things from the outset, you know, even before we were a cloud provider. There's this saying within Google, which is we build reliable software on unreliable hardware. Operating the scale will do. The presumption is that hardware will always fail, but that doesn't mean that you have to have your software also has to fail. That's become manifest in um, in a set of disciplines which are now you know, broadly in the industry under the title you know, site reliability engineering. I'm sure many people on this uh, on this session have heard of. If you haven't, I'd encourage you to go and read the site reliability engineering book. But that's an example of how reliability, not just as a technology but as a discipline is built deeply into the way we do things, the fact that we effectively created a profession. And now part of what we do is to work with customers to, um, to bring um, uh, that site reliability engineering discipline to, to the entire world. It's been increasingly becoming a, a standard. So that's reliability. There's a lot more dimensions of reliability, but those are three, I think, are particularly important. Then on resilience, I think the three things I call out on resilience, the first, first key thing for us is um, we just try to accept reality. You know, we, we could point at all those reliability features I've just talked about and said, the chances of a global hyperscale platform failing all in one go are extremely remote, therefore we don't need to plan for it. Um, and we do believe that the chances are extremely remote from a technical perspective. We also don't think the right thing to do is not plan for it. What we're you know, acutely aware of is that however reliable our technical platform is, however great our partnership is with our customers, this is a commercial relationship and we're a commercial provider and things don't always go well and things change. There may be good reasons to, to move away from us or from any other provider. So I think the, the, the first thing we just you know, live by is we just accept the reality of having to help our customers plan for the day that may never happen. The other two things is, you know, because Google is at heart an engineering company, is to treat that reality as an engineering problem and figure out how to engineer for it. And again, there are many ways we do for that, but I think two that stand out Firstly, is we have a deeply ingrained commitment to open source. So a good example of that is that um, Kubernetes, which hopefully everybody's aware of, but just in case you're not aware of it, you know, the increasingly standard container management platform that many things in the world run on, invented by Google as an open source version of a thing called Borg, which was invented by Google to run hyperscale global infrastructure. Released as an open source project, now I think one of the most popular open source projects in the world, Google is still the primary contributor, but has also now become a standard um, managed service platform available to you know, pretty much across all, all cloud platforms. And we are committed to continue to contribute to the Kubernetes community. I mean, Steve said, portability is not a magic bullet. It doesn't, you know, Running Kubernetes doesn't make it instantly portable everywhere, but it's a huge step in standardization and you know, open standards. The last point on resilience is the other point about accepting reality is we also accept a multi-cloud reality. I think everybody knows Google was not the first to the market for cloud, the same way as we were first to the market for search. Um, so therefore, you know, when we turn up, many of our customers already have another cloud provider in place. So for us, multi-cloud is just part of reality. So one of the things that we try to do is to create a world in which people can run a Google Cloud platform-like environment across both on-premise and other clouds. And our product for that is called Anthos, mostly container-focused at the moment. But we do, um, uh, we, we are extending that to include more services. And that's again, again part of our commitment to creating, making a real, practical, manageable multi-cloud world. And then the last point I'll just wrap up with is, you know, there's two R's there, reliability and resilience. Obviously, both those R's are a, a, a response to the first overriding R, which is that of risk. I think the other thing we try and do is to, we don't imagine that any of these technology solutions are a binary one size fits all um, answer to anybody's needs. One of the things we try to do is to say, 
what we're creating is a range of responses to different modes of risk and they we will work them work with customers to help them um, help them uh, design their right response to that type of risk whether that's building sre capability adopting multi-cloud using open source and open standards and then the last point i make on that risk point and again really echoing steve here is that we recognize that that response to risk is not just a technology problem by placing important business services critical business processes on our platform people are you know, our customers are trusting our platform with stuff that is vital to the, the success and continued operation, continued safe operation of their business. We think that it's important that everybody, business and technology people, deeply understand cloud and the choices they are making on behalf of their enterprise. So one of the things we're investing quite heavily in is education programs, training programs, turning up alongside our customers to talk to business leaders as well as technology leaders to make sure they truly understand why the assertion I made at the beginning um, that the, uh, we can achieve reliability outcomes and resilience outcomes better on cloud platforms than we can on premise is something that they can um, uh, they can believe to be true as well. For that note, I'll hand back to James to, to cover off the questions. Thank you very much, David. Some great points there, and 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 thank you for in inclusion in the in the working group. It's been great to get a. Uh, many of the CSP kind of perspectives because it's as part of the shared responsibility model it's, it's essential to get both sides of the coin in terms of coming to the, to the table for this. Uh, noting we've got about three minutes remaining and, and I think uh, it'd be fair to say we could discuss this for, for many more uh, minutes and hours and, and we have done. Uh, there are three questions that I can see and, and, and apologies I will try and kind of summarize them in terms of uh, the intent. So. Um, Rena, I know you've, you've, you've shared two here that we can see. So um, any challenges faced as part of complying with EBA outsourcing guidelines would be very helpful, especially generic finding of gaps identified in the due diligence on operational resilience, incident management, monitoring capability and auditability of these controls. So I'm not sure, Sebastian or Steve, yeah. if you have a very quick kind of thoughts on that. Yeah, maybe a quick answer um, to that because the EBA, the guidelines are quite sophisticated, very, um, you know, uh, uh, very, very good paper. Yes, yeah, so and good guidelines. I think the, the biggest things what I, I learned out of that is like, um, it is still written in a mindset of data center centric. Um, uh, we, we are still seeing a lot of these guidelines, what we are getting there when it's coming to backup, incident management, restoring, monitoring, and so on. Uh, we we are still have some education to give them, okay, the cloud is a bit different. The cloud is not like now one data center and uh, operating that, even when you talk about an availability zone in the cloud, is not just, uh, you know, that uh, what, what people think in a physical world. Yes, so that is my, my quick answer to that. So that's the biggest lessons learned that how we are getting guidelines, they are not wrong, but they are still reflecting, I will say, the traditional thinking and mindset. Yeah. I'd back Sebastian up completely there, James. Certainly from my side, that was my point about being prepared to consider alternative ways and thinking about the outcome. So the big one that, that springs to my mind, which has been a challenge for us, which is not necessarily, it's, it's EBA, but it, it's kind of beyond that, is the kind of guidance that happens around patch management, for example, where there's talk for you to need to have an effective patch management system. That plagued us and has plagued us for years in terms of our use of immutable infrastructure, where historically, you know, it's taken us some time to get to the point where people accept that having a servers which are constantly built off the latest golden image and have a very short time scale of life is the same as having a patch management solution that can update them. And many of those solutions, to be honest, have a massive impact on build and, and launch time for servers, right? So it, it, it's about considering the outcome and the intent and trying to look at alternative ways of fulfilling it. And I think that's particularly where we the, the, the paper has, has looked to um, bring bring many of these kind of resilience elements uh, into the the cloud paradigm, which I think is that evolution yeah. of thinking from probably traditional infrastructure. And whilst cloud is is in essence built up of traditional infrastructure, the the different paradigm steps up as you move through the the different levels. Yeah, um, absolutely. We, we're nearly at time. We've got two more questions. So one, I think very quickly, you nearly covered Steve is around, what are your views on the effectiveness of codes of conduct and other self-regulatory approaches to cloud? 
Uh, so I, I suppose uh, uh, what a what a great question. So there's there's two sides to that. One one is in terms of what we see going on with the, the cloud vendors at the moment. There's there's some great stuff coming on uh, from the vendors in terms of uh, let's say portability and the ability the ability to to transition and having services around that which are going along. I, I think you know uh, AFME uh, uh, themselves have, have have done some work around that, and I think that's going really uh, it's really going in the right kind of direction for me. It's early days to work out whether specific ones are the right answer yet but i suppose from my personal belief what we try what we really want to try and do is drive voluntary programs which are are driven by the vendors and and where possible stay away from kind of very binary mandatory regulation if you see what i mean so that it can allow us to again consider how we meet those needs in different ways or otherwise we we risk really limiting or constraining the cloud opportunity for or for for organizations like us uh, uh, by having very kind of tightly defined regulation, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. I think that's one of the other big points coming through the paper is really guarding against or trying to avoid being too yeah. uh, overly prescriptive, which does start to, to limit the, the benefits and, and opportunities for the cloud. Yeah. Uh, and, and last one, final, but given the tiered ecosystem of cloud platform solutions, to what extent do we need federate federate issues and accountability at the application slash other product vendor layers. I'm not sure, Sebastian, David, if you have any thoughts in response yeah, to that. So I think it's a great, great question. Uh, from my perspective, maybe we are all learning uh, to, to really, is there a best answer to that? What is right, what is wrong? I, I, I don't feel that. I can more give my personal experience where we are so far and so on. And I think a um, lot of challenges what I'm getting with this client cloud platforms, especially, especially also I would extend this to the vendor products, third party tools and all of that. It's like as more and more complexity I get into the cloud service provider, as more I have to do as a bank than to integrate and to test and to life cycle and to, you know, with all obsolescence, with all requirements, and then it not fits anymore of the purpose of the cloud, that I get an infrastructure, I'm following all of their cloud services, rather than doing too many add-ons in that and getting uh, a lot of additional complexity to my applications, and also giving them more complexity, because then I'm getting in a very, very complex, uh, you know, footprint. But what is right, what is wrong, especially with security tools, multi-cloud strategy, uh, I think we are still on the journey to say, is this right? Is this wrong? My lessons learned so far is more I'm staying as, you know, uh, uh, you know, completely integrated services by one cloud service provider and going this step forward is gave me less effort on our side with the life cycle and all with that compared to when I'm, I'm getting to cross features, functions and systems across clouds. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, sorry, just David, we're, we're just at time okay. to um, no wrap up, unfortunately. I think um, um, everyone can appreciate that, that, as I mentioned earlier, we could talk about it and have been talking about this for, for many months. And uh, many of uh, Sebastian's, uh, David and Steve's points and comments and many of the other firms who've taken part uh, in, in the development of this uh, position paper uh, come through in the paper. Uh, we do invite you to uh, review the paper. Um, please reach out if you do have additional questions, would like to discuss things in more detail. Uh, it is a very timely and topical um, area and theme, uh, as we can all agree. Uh, and we do look forward to, to speaking about this in, in more detail uh, in future. So thank you very much to Sebastian, Dave and Steve for, for joining me this morning. Thank you very much to everyone for uh, joining us in this session. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and we will hand over from here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you.